But uh, I think now is pretty much a, as good a time as any to to really get into the reason that we're here, and that is, you know, blockchain. So um, it's my absolute pleasure to to welcome South Africa's foremost expert on blockchain technology. Um, our guest speaker today, please would you give him a warm round of applause, Lorian Gamaroff. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks for uh, coming here today and thank you Meltwater for inviting me. Um, this is obviously a very hot topic uh, uh, right now. You know, people are talking about this thing changing the world and what's going on here. Everything's going to be different in the future. Um, so what I want to do today is I'm going to give you a lot more than just this sort of marketing spiel. My, my intent uh, after this is for you to leave here and go onto your LinkedIn profile and actually write the word blockchain. And also to write the word Bitcoin, because what we're going to do today is I, I'm going to take you through the history of the world uh, uh, in the 35 minutes that I have. I want to give you the context of uh, where we've been over the last 10, 15, 20 years, and uh, to then present you a picture of why we have this thing that's now rattling the kind of financial uh, services world. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to talk very quickly because I've got so much to tell you. So many uh, interesting things about this, this new wave of tech that's transforming the world uh, and that I really want you to have a deep understanding of why we're here and what all this is about. Okay, and you're going to see that this is not just about this thing blockchain. It's also going to be about this even more important thing in my view, and I'm going to tell you why I think it's more important, but Bitcoin. Now, uh, uh, obviously, when it comes to the, the technology blockchain, you know, technologies are neutral. Uh, they are uh, possibly uh, disruptive. Um, and so blockchain has become this kind of politically correct word that we use for this disruption that's happening, but Bitcoin is actually something that's much more groundbreaking and much more fundamental uh, uh, when it comes to how does a state run? How do people interact? How do they trade? How do they uh, create commerce, uh, industry? You're going to see how at the end of this, how Bitcoin is going to be the real thing that changes every one of our lives in ways that we yet can't even imagine. And I'm going to try to give you a taste of uh, what that is all about. But, you know, human beings are very funny things. Uh, whenever it comes to uh, uh, upgrades or new features on the technology we already have, we love that. You know, we all have our iPhones or our Samsungs and we all were looking forward to the next version or, or the next version of the software that gives us more you know, uh, features or more power over the tech that we have. But when it comes to completely new technology or new things, human beings actually have this kind of resistance to it. You know, we, we, we look at brand new things with the, with the same uh, 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 perspective. You know, it's always fear, uncertainty, doubts, skepticism. You know, uh, I'm sure you can look back in your own life and uh, uh, I think we're all probably old enough here to remember time when there wasn't the internet. I don't know, maybe uh, uh, for some of you that's a difficult thing to imagine. But uh, when I was a teenager, we didn't have the internet. We didn't even have mobile phones. Well, they were there, but they weren't you know, every, in everyone's pocket. Um, and uh, uh, when these new things came along, it's not like everyone thought, oh, the internet, this is so cool, this is so amazing. Uh, um, we, you know, we had that sense of, whoa, this is strange. You know, what's this going to do to our lives? What's it going to do to our society? So we just look at the last hundred years. Uh, we've had all these innovations, you know, telephones and airplanes and, and uh, a whole lot of things. Um, and if you go back, if you go and look at uh, uh, when those technologies came along, you're going to see that people didn't embrace it at first. You know, they, they, if you think about the radio, I remember uh, reading about the radio, and when, when the radio first came along, people were horrified. They thought, well, now no one's ever going to want to go out to shows or anything. You're going to stay at home in your dark room and be antisocial. Or the telephone, you're never going to speak to people face to face anymore. You're going to now only uh, communicate the, with them indirectly. Um, if we look at... Uh, uh, um, the internet itself, you know, the internet was a very scary thing back in the 90s. Uh, my uh, my um, um, background is a software engineer. I studied uh, computer science. And uh, when I started at Rhodes University, the internet was just kind of uh, uh, coming along. But people had this kind of fear of it. You know, it was all about uh, uh, suspicious people in, in shady chat rooms. Who were those people talking to my children? Uh, you know, where does that information fly to? Where does it go? Why do I need it? It's the post office. Um, you know, that when cars came along, you know, we look at cars today and we think, you know, I mean, modern civilization couldn't 
we couldn't have one without a, a car. But um, when, when uh, cars first came along, there was this thing called the Red Flag Act, where you had to have somebody stand and walk in front of the car with a red flag, because this thing barreling down the street at 20 kilometers an hour was a terrifying prospect. So we had to have this uh, a red flag. Um, again, this is just how it is with new technology. You know, we, we can't think of it in the context of our lives because our whole lives have been without that thing. But then suddenly it, it kind of has that sense of, whoa, what's this going to enable? You know, is this going to be the kind of disintegration of, of civilization? Now, let's go back to the internet. When I first started surfing the internet, this is what it looked like. This was links. I don't know, if, are there any techie people here? Um, I was on this at, uh, in the computer science labs and I loved it. You know, I could now go and communicate with all these universities around the world. I thought it was amazing, you know, downloading things. But if I showed this to any of my friends who weren't in computer science or my family or anything like that, they, were, they didn't get that the internet, you know, was so cool and, and interesting. It just looked complicated and boring, to be honest. But then an amazing thing happened. Suddenly we had Netscape. And does anyone remember this? That when this came along, it was like, okay, that's it. We've now reached, you know, the future. You know, look how amazing the internet is. There's 466 websites about art. Isn't that amazing how huge the internet is? Um, but again, you know, if, if I gave this to my mom or somebody like that, they would have just thought this is hideous and, and uh, impractical. I much prefer my, my uh, you know, those Encyclopedia Britannicas. You know, I can like page and I can look at pictures. It all looks beautiful. And then Amazon.com came out and this was also amazing. You know, suddenly now we have Amazon and we can buy a million books online. But Again, this didn't uh, inspire any kind of uh, enthusiasm or confidence. I think the most important thing th at that time was, first of all, the navigation and figuring it out, but also payments. You know, uh, uh, what, one of the things about the dot-com crash, which was in 2000, was that, sure, we had all these cool things. Okay, you could buy pet food online, but nobody actually wanted to put sensitive payment information into the internet. So, you know, very famous people. If you go look online now, if you type in Internet 1995 on YouTube, you're going to get some very funny CNBC or Fox News uh, inserts about this thing called the internet and uh, that at sign. You know, what is this at sign? What is it? Is it about or is it at? Um, nobody got it. And a, a very famous quote from a very famous uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, Paul Krugman, who's still around today and still advises governments today. Uh, this is what he says. By 2005, the internet will have as much impact as the fax machine. Now, when last did you use a fax machine? So, so clearly he was wrong. And it just shows you that when a technology comes along and it uh, presents itself to us, it's, it's always the same. It's always kind of clunky and, and uh, doesn't really work properly and uh, it's awkward. Uh, you know, uh, it sort of shows you some promise, but at the end of the day, you, know, you, you imagine your life being better without it. That's just, that's just innovation and that's technology. But that internet thing, that little protocol, which we call TCP IP, which is actually the backbone of the internet, eventually flowered into this thing that fills all of our lives. We all have this powerful device in our pockets now and we, none of us can live without the internet. You know, uh, if any of you go throughout the day without looking at your WhatsApp or without going onto Twitter, I mean, we just did it now. You know, that's, that sounds crazy. Yeah. So um, this is just how it is. And uh, uh, this is just a cartoon that kind of shows you. I love this cartoon. You know, uh, life before Google. Uh, uh, what would you guys do if the Google doesn't exist? I know I wouldn't be a, around today. Okay, so it just shows you that uh, 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 the internet is an incredible thing. It started out strange. Uh, uh, we didn't know how it was going to be a, an improvement to the way things are done. But eventually technology evolves and it transforms and it changes and eventually becomes something that fills our, our lives. Now, another Nobel Prize winning economist was a, a guy called Milton Friedman. Okay, and uh, he died in early 2000. So he died before Facebook and he died before uh, Amazon became so enormous. But he could see how the internet was transforming our lives, you know, in terms of communication. But the thing that was missing, and in fact, even today, is a fundamental flaw when it comes to the internet and how we engage on the internet. And that comes down to payments. If you want to now go and make a payment for something online, what you're doing is you're handing over your credit card information, your sensitive information, and you're hoping, there's a lot of trust in that, that the company that you're giving that information to isn't going to lose it, uh, isn't going to take more money than uh, they are that they're allowed to take. Um, but also, not only that is the trust on your part, the trust is on the merchant's part as well. Because they have to now know or be convinced that you are in fact the owner of that credit card. And we know that the industry right now is plagued with a lot of fraud. You know, I mean, I, I've had money taken out of my credit card. And all I did was I went to the bank and I said, listen, I didn't authorize those payments. 
It was online. And so what happens? The merchant uh, uh, has to uh, just suck it up. So Milton Friedman could see that this was the problem, and this was the downfall of the internet in early 2000s, where people did not trust putting their information online. And he said, and this is his quote just before he said, uh, died, he said, the one thing that's missing but that will soon be invented is a reliable e-cash. Now, um, uh, uh, an e-cash doesn't mean uh, a bank uh, a currency, like a credit card, where what you're doing is you're instructing your bank to move money. It's actually in the same way cash sits in your pocket, like a little piece of paper that you can now carry around with you and you can hand over to somebody without having to trust that the, that that, uh, that person is who they say they are. If you go to a shop, you don't ask for the, the merchant's uh, information and the merchant doesn't ask for your information because the trust is built into that little piece of paper, that little token that you're transacting with. Um, and we don't have that today. We don't have this digital e-cash. But Milton Friedman said, one day, this will happen. Um, now, let me explain to you again. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, as I said to you, I really want to dig deep into uh, uh, what's going on here. So when you leave, you have a much solid, uh, more solid understanding of what we're talking about and then can understand the impact that this is going to make uh, again on our lives. So every now and again, I'm going to switch out and, and take you to school. And I'm going to take you to school right now. Uh, uh, with this bore, very boring looking slide. I've got a few of these, so you're going to have to uh, uh, tolerate them. But this is how the banking system works today. We have this big institution, and at that institution, it's got a big database or a spreadsheet, and on that spreadsheet, there's account numbers, and there's uh, uh, people's information, and uh, uh, whenever you want to now make a transaction, if you are going to go to a merchant, um, what you're going to do is you're going to go and hand over your credit card at the merchant. But money isn't flying from that piece of plastic into the merchant's uh, bank account. What happens is that you send an instruction to your bank, and you say, please, bank, can you go and take money out of my, my account, or, or can you deduct a balance of my account, and can you go and uh, accredit uh, the uh, merchant's account? And uh, uh, this is how the system works, and that's where the flaw happens. Because now, first of all, you have all these complicated sets of intermediaries behind there that add fees, but now because you have this, this kind of um, uh, uh, transaction where the, what's called a card, uh, the, you know, the, the card is now being uh, handed over and there's sensitive information. Uh, we have this flawed system and we have this potential for there to be a credit card fraud and we all pay for that. We're all paying premiums and insurance on, on top of those credit card transactions. So let's now go again. I want to now um, talk to you about uh, what a digital cash is. Now, since 2000, in fact, even before 2000, since the internet's being, been worked on, people have been trying to figure this out. How do we create a reliable digital cash token that works exactly like physical cash, where you don't have to communicate information to a bank and you don't have to part with any of your sensitive information? Uh, businesses and governments and you know, companies and banks have been trying to figure out how to fulfill Milton Friedman's prophecy of a reliable digital e-cash. And this is kind of what it would look like. You know, a, a bank could issue this little digital token and then we could go and uh, uh, send it directly to uh, the merchant. And as you can see, because it's this little digital thing, whatever that is, uh, the merchant, you know, again, would know if they're receiving it, they've got it now. It's not a case of one day the, 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 the customer is going to come back and say, sorry, I didn't authorize that. Um, but there's been so many problems around this, and it's just hasn't happened. For the last 30 years, this has been the goal. Everybody knows that this is, was going to happen eventually, but nobody has been able to figure it out, how to create a system like this that can, in fact, definitely change our lives, especially in terms of the premiums we pay and the trust we have to have in, in that system. But then, uh, let me take you back a little bit uh, uh, in history again to the year 2008. Do you, can you remember that far back? Uh, in 2008, uh, uh, this was uh, um, uh, printed by the, the Zimbabwean Central Bank. I actually am Zimbabwean, although I left Zimbabwe when I was very young, but I remember this clearly, this idea of these hundreds of trillions of dollars that were now floating around in the economy that were completely useless. Um, and we now have uh, uh, this currency that basically has destroyed itself. It doesn't exist anymore. There's no such thing as this uh, uh, Zimbabwe dollar. Now, what actually happened there? Uh, uh, if we're not talking about cash, we're talking about the financial system, what went on? Uh, uh, what were the central bankers thinking? This is a picture of what the, the supply of currency 
that uh, Zimbabwe Central Bank was creating and printing up until 2008, to which ultimately led to the destruction of the Zimbabwe dollar. This is the, the rate of inflation. This is what's called hyperinflation. Hyperinflation doesn't mean your prices are going to the moon. It means that the supply of currency in the economy is, is being rapidly uh, printed and created. And this is what uh, led to the demise of the Zimbabwe currency. But you know that uh, in the world today, Zimbabwe is, is the 56th case in the last 100 years of hyperinflation. And you know that there is now a 57th country that is now hyperinflating. Do you know what that is? Venezuela. And if we look at Venezuela, the supply of currency in Venezuela, this is what it looks like. You can't tell the difference. Now, obviously, you know, when you look at this, you think, who's, who put these central bankers in charge? What textbooks are they reading where, where this becomes a reality in any country? And uh, what I decided to do when I looked at these charts, and this comes from a, a very cool website. If you, if you haven't been on it yet, you should look at it. It's called tradingeconomics.com. And what they do is they collect all these interesting statistics around uh, countries, the, econ the economic uh, uh, st stats like GDP and interest rates and, and money supply. And I thought, let me go and look at South Africa. Let's go see what South Africa looks like. And this is actually the rate of supply of currency in our own country. Now, when you look at something like this, does this give you any confidence in your own rand? I know that we, there's been a lot of political turmoil and we are you know, downgraded to junk and all that sort of thing. And so obviously we all get that there's something uh, uh, fishy going on. But have you ever noticed our, our, our supply of inflation, or the rate of the supply of money? This is not the only thing. It's not just South Africa. We're not the next in line. I decided to go look at China, and this is what China looks like. Uh, what about the best currency in the world? Who wants to earn the U.S. dollars? Should we go look at the U.S. dollar uh, uh, supply? This is what it looks like. Can you see since 2008, this is now after the Zimbabwe dollar uh, died, that the entire, all currencies around the world have been hyperinflating since 2008. So this is a very, very frightening prospect because the only uh, uh, outcome for this is the destruction and the, and the end of the financial system as we know it because the, the, the US dollar is the reserve currency. And the reason why currencies have been inflating for the last uh, eight, uh, almost 10 years is because of this. So what actually happened in 2008 for this to happen? It was the, the global financial crisis uh, where uh, what happened was, did you hear about the subprime mortgages? So basically banks were loaning out uh, money to people that shouldn't have had that money loaned to them. And uh, do you know what happens when you deposit money into a bank? You're actually loaning your money to the bank. And uh, if you loan your money to somebody who uh, uh, goes bankrupt or defaults, that's too bad for you. You should have uh, done better due diligence before loaning your money to that bank. So what happened was the banks eventually became insolvent because all these loans went bad and now they had no more money. And what they decided to do was go to the, the uh, Congress and the Reserve Bank and say, listen, if you don't give us money, we're not going to be able to open tomorrow and the people are going to come and try to get money out of the ATMs. There's not going to be any money. And basically there's going to be, you know, that, you know, we saw Ferguson and all those types of riots. It's going to be that times a million where the whole country is going to start erupting in riots and violence and all that sort of thing. And they uh, managed to convince the Federal Reserve to start bailing out all the banks and printing this money. And that's why we see this chart uh, that's happened over there. Now, a lot of us will think, okay, fine, Lauren, that's interesting statistics, but hang on, I haven't noticed this in my own life. I mean, I haven't noticed that I have to pay $100 billion for three eggs, which is what three eggs cost in Zim uh, just prior to 2008. So what's going on here? If we look at the inflation uh, of the reserve currency, which now m uh, mimics and matches all the, the, the currency around the world, where's all that inflation going? Well, if you look at the, the stock market, uh, if you were to now overlay the stock market, and I did this for you, this is what it looks like. Can you see that little bubble just prior to that? That was the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, uh, the stock market collapsed. And then look how it's been now steadily climbing exactly almost a one-to-one -one correlation with the rate of inflation that's been going on in the U.S. And this is what's been happening around the world. If you were to go look at the, the stock market in Venezuela, you're going to see that the stock market is literally at the, to the moon. And anybody looking at the stock market would say, wow, this is great. I'm, I wish I'd invested in the, the, the Venezuelan stock market uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but that's now uh, uh, where all the inflation has gone. And that, uh, the Bolivar now is worth... Uh, it's, it's going to become uh, worth nothing. Now, if you're not uh, convinced by this, that, uh, that, um, that uh, all that inflation is now going into these fixed assets. So I know this is very economical, but we, we're going to have to talk about this so you understand why Bitcoin and blockchain are so important. 
Um, if you're not convinced that uh, all this uh, money that's being uh, uh, pumped into the system is now being inflating all these stocks, this, this, how are these for some quotes? The Central Bank of Switzerland now owns more f uh, stock there in Facebook than Mark Zuckerberg. Um, the Bank of Japan is the number one shareholder it will be by the end of the year in the top 88 co uh, companies in, in, uh, in Japan. So can you see how all this money isn't going into consumer prices yet? Uh, it, it, it eventually will, uh, but it's been going into the stock market. Now, over time, the system that we have, this paper money system, it's called a fiat system. Uh, back in the olden days, money used to be linked to gold. You know, we used to have a gold-backed currency, uh, uh, and, and you wouldn't. And it was very difficult to, to inflate a currency unless you had that actual gold there. But since 1971, the world went off the gold standard, and now we've had this new financial system where people, uh, central banks, can just print and print and print. And we can actually see how that has been eroding the value of your currencies. I mean, if you just think back when you were a little kid, so how much pocket money you got. I mean, I, I, let's say 30 years ago, you know, uh, 35 years ago, I, you know, I was getting like 20 cents a, a week. Um, uh, well, it wasn't a lot even then, but I could, you know, I could go out and buy a lot of sweets and, and you know, make myself happy. Uh, what can you do with that today? You know, uh, I tell my kids, you know, you buy those chappies. I don't know. I think they're ran now. I don't know what they are. You know, they were half a cent when I was uh, uh, buying them. Um, but if you look at the U.S. dollar again, you know, the, the purchasing power and the strength of the dollar. This is another statistic. This is these are charts, by the way, from the Federal Reserve itself. This is the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar in the last hundred years since the the central bank was created. The U.S. dollar has lost 98 percent of its value over the last hundred years, and eventually it's going to lose that last little. Two percent and it's going to become worthless. Now, this is a, 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 a phenomenon that's going on around the world. And uh, if you have never been aware of these sorts of things, this is going to have em enormous co uh, consequences for all of us. But we are all, most of us, kind of just going through life hoping, hoping that the people in charge have things under control and they would never uh, 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 take us down the rabbit hole where we you know, ultimately destroy our wealth and, like they did in Zimbabwe. But we've seen how time and time again economies ultimately implode, especially those that have a, a, a non-gold-backed currency. Now, what you're going to say, what has this got to do with marketing and all that sort of thing? Ultimately, we're going to get to why we have such a thing as Bitcoin and why Bitcoin exists. Uh, uh, in 2008, when this was going on, the, the developers that, were, were, uh, that built Bitcoin, the technology behind Bitcoin, were inspired by these events, you know, the hyperinflation that was happening around the world. And what they imagined was a new kind of system, a new kind of digital financial system that worked exactly like the gold system, you know, where you don't have this ability to hyperinflate your currency. So let's uh, uh, just look at another chart. Um, by the way, this chart over here, a lot of economists, if you go and look online now, uh, hopefully this becomes an interest of yours now where you start looking at e economics. Uh, I know economics sounds boring to you. It was extremely boring for me and, and only since since 2010, when I got involved with Bitcoin, have become interested in these things. But I've been extremely uh, 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 shocked as well as interested in how the system works. And a lot of economists are actually saying that this is a, a, a not a unplanned. Uh, uh, everybody knows that ultimately financial systems end and new ones are created. And uh, if we go look at uh, uh, history, you know, the, the US dollar hasn't been the world reserve currency uh, forever. If we just go look back in time, uh, uh, you know, in the, 14, uh, in the 15th century, uh, the Port uh, Portugal had the reserve currency, then it was Spain, then it was uh, Netherlands, France. Um, and then Britain, and then ultimately the US dollar. But can you see the size of the flag is actually the time span that that currency was the world reserve system. Can you see how historically world reserve currencies don't last forever? And in fact, the US dollar is almost exactly uh, at that point where historically there has been a new sort of financial system. And uh, these economists and these central bankers and these PhD, uh, PhD people obviously are aware of these sorts of things. So it's not a, so much a conspiracy as an inevitable consequence that we are looking, all of us, at a time where uh, there's going to possibly uh, be uh, uh, an, uh, an end of this, the system that we have today, where we have this uh, reserve, the US reserve currency, uh, and uh, uh, this paper backed uh, currency like these uh, RANDs that we have today, and possibly a new financial system that is coming imminently.
And ultimately, this, uh, this crash is a, is a planned event. Now, uh, 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 you can uh, uh, make your own assumptions about that, and, and you must certainly go back and, and look at these things. But, you know, I stumbled onto a, a very interesting uh, Economist magazine. You know, The Economist? So it's not like uh, some uh, crackpot magazine. 1988. This is the cover of the, of the Economist in 1988. It says they get ready for a world currency. At the bottom is uh, all these paper currencies, the dollar uh, and a whole bunch of others, the pound. And they are flaming and they are burning. And out of the ashes is this phoenix rising. And it says uh, on there, 2018. Now, if you go look at this article, it's a very interesting article. The article uh, talks about how uh, uh, what would really make sense in the world is a global currency. It would be much more efficient and much more uh, viable uh, in, a, in a global world that we live today. And in 1988, this article was all about the potential for the IMF perhaps to create, a, and in fact, the IMF has a currency. It's called the Special Drawing Right, the SDR, uh, that this could become the global currency. But isn't this incredible? And at the end of the article, this is what they say, pencil in the phoenix, because they call the currency the phoenix, for around 2018 and welcome it when it comes. 2018, that's next year. Oh, we, we, we see these uh, uh, things happening around the world, hyperinflation. We see uh, uh, demise of currency, the value of currencies. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's almost like uh, this is something that none of us should be surprised about unless, you know, uh, you know we, we haven't really been looking at these sorts of things. So, you know, there's, there's a, a time coming, and it's probably going to be in 2018, if the economist knows anything about it, where all of us are going to be looking at a new world, where suddenly now we don't have the systems that we have today, and there's going to be some new kind of system, some kind of world currency. And if you have any assets that are denominated in your local currencies, maybe they are going to become uh, worthless in the same way they are in Venezuela and um, uh, Zimbabwe. Let's now get back into uh, uh, a few years ago in October 2015. This was on the cover of The Economist again. And it said, it talked about Bitcoin and it talked about blockchain. And it said, this is the most important invention since the internet. Now, when, when, you know, when The Economist says something like that, you know, people take notice. Uh, it talked about this new kind of technology, blockchain, that is going to disintermediate the banking system and it's going to do all these wonderful things. And I'm going to hopefully uh, talk more about that uh, if we have time. By the way, um, we have 35 minutes, but uh, I won't be offended if I, go, if I go over time and you guys want to start walking out of here. As I said, I, I've got so much to tell you and I really want you to have a solid grounding so when you walk out of here, you can speak with authority about this and also be excited about it and uh, be able to now decide, make decisions that, that uh, put you on this path, this new thing that's happening in the world today um, that can make you still relevant in the future. You know, there's a lot of talk about robots taking over people's jobs and jobs that are going to be, uh, become irrelevant. So obviously you want to be the kinds of people who don't fall by the wayside. You want to you be, you know, with it and uh, uh, you want to now, uh, you know, understand these things. So I would love to, to, for you to be able to uh, get through this whole presentation so you have that, that uh, grounding and then you can carry on on your own. Anyway, so this was ha what happened uh, in 2015 and there has been, t since that time, a stream of quotes from the World Economic Forum. It's going to be, the blockchain will become the beating heart of the financial system. The Bank of England, a significant innovation. You know, there's just so much uh, uh, of these uh, quotes out there. Uh, Goldman Sachs says it's going to change everything. And if you are still not convinced uh, that uh, uh, people are looking at this as something that is going to be as impactful as the internet was itself, old, old Bill Gates, of course we have to take his word for it, right? Um, he thinks uh, Bitcoin and blockchain is a technological tour de force. So uh, are you convinced now that uh, maybe there's something to this? Uh, and it's not just this funny little technical thing that you know, techies are going to be involved with or maybe economists are going to be involved with. But one day you guys, in the same way you interact with the internet every day, in surprising ways that you had no idea about 20 years ago, you are going to be interacting with this new thing in forms and, and ways that we have no idea about in the next 10 years, in the same way that the internet transformed everything in, over the 20 years. Who knows what the world is going to look like in 10 years? I have, a, I have a sense of it. I'm going to try and share that with you. Okay, what is this thing called blockchain and what is this thing called Bitcoin and how does it work? I'm going to take you back to school. All right, let's go uh, uh, and, and talk about what's go, what, how does it work and, and what's so special about this thing called Bitcoin and blockchain. Later on, I'm going to tell you what the difference is uh, and uh, uh, so you know that there's very, very, very much a difference. You know, it's like saying email and the internet, Bitcoin and the blockchain. 
All right, that's kind of, uh, if you're wondering how they relate to each other, that's kind of how they relate to each other. So let's go back to our bank and the way things are. And I said to you, banks have these spreadsheets and these databases and they have accounts in it. But what this new technology did, this new Bitcoin blockchain technology uh, created, and this was the innovation that solved the problem of creating a digital cash. It said, hang on, this is now, uh, if you understand this, by the way, you understand 99% of it. Imagine a system that wasn't governed and uh, controlled by a bank. Imagine you could now have a system like that, but remove the organization, remove, remove the central authority, remove the governance around that thing. And what you do now is you have a group of volunteers around the world where they are now participating in the system and they are going to be doing what the banks do where they are processing transactions. So what happens now is we make a copy of that ledger or that uh, bank balance uh, statement sheet or whatever it is, and you distribute it amongst all these volunteers around the world. And so now there isn't one central authority. There isn't one point of failure. This, this little uh, account, this ledger that retracts the transactions and has balances on it is now distributed around the world, but more importantly, is decentralized around the world. And this is the most important word today. The theme of today is what's called decentralization. And our whole lives are run by centralized services, you know, Uber and Google and Facebook and the banks and everything that you do it always has some kind of central authority that's managing things. What Bitcoin created was a system that nobody manages it, but everybody does. Anybody who wants to participate in this. So now, these computers are all around the world and anybody could do this. You guys could have your own server that's running and you could have a copy of this ledger and you could now process transactions. But in doing so, you need to be incentivized to do that. And uh, the way that the system was created was to uh, uh, reward people who will now want to contribute to the system and create a system like this. So every time these computers process transactions, what they're doing is they're earning these tokens called Bitcoins, which now increments their balances. Uh, I'll talk more about why Bitcoin, people are thinking about Bitcoin as money, because uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about how Bitcoin is money. Uh, a lot of people struggle with that notion. You know, uh, they think, where is it? What is it? It's nothing. It's like just this digital stuff. Uh, I can't feel it. I can't, you know, uh, see it. Um, the irony there is that uh, how many of you, uh, you know, use credit cards? You don't see that money. It doesn't exist. It's just noughts and ones. But these now computers are all around the world processing these transactions and they're being rewarded for that. And uh, it's completely distributed around the world. And so what we have now is this new kind of internet. It's this internet of value instead of this internet of information. All right. So this is now uh, uh, this picture that we have today, this, this network of, of uh, computers all volunteering their resources and processing transactions on our behalf. And uh, it's an incredible thing, this, because uh, uh, now we don't have to trust central banks. We don't have to have a system that can be manipulated by a central authority. And this is what is making people so excited about uh, uh, the, this new kind of currency that we have today. Um, and uh, or the nice thing about it, just like with the internet, you know, the internet, uh, anybody, one of you can now open your laptops and you can connect to uh, the internet and you can use it without permission. We now have this new kind of bank, this distributed decentralized bank that anybody can connect to without permission. And this is very interesting and, and uh, important. Um, now people, you know, we talk about the unbanked around South, uh, Africa, you know, 80% of people are, are unbanked. Um, there's a, a lot of barriers to entry in that uh, to get bank accounts, you know, fee care and all that sort of thing. Well, imagine you, you could create a bank account without, ask, without asking anybody's permission. That is going to be uh, incredibly uh, disruptive uh, for the banking system, but also by creating services and things for people that didn't have them traditionally. By the way, why is it called a, a, a blockchain? So this whole technology that I've been talking about now is the blockchain. When we talk about blockchain, we're talking about this decentralized distributed banking system. Okay, that is what the blockchain is all about. So if someone says blockchain, we're talking about this decentralized ledger that records transactions. But why is it called a blockchain? Let me explain to you that. So if you know what a spreadsheet is, there's transactions in that spreadsheet, and every uh, 10 minutes or so, all these transactions are grouped together, 
and uh, record it into this database that's distributed everywhere. And then 10 minutes goes by and another group of transactions are recorded and put onto this database and linked with the old one. Uh, and this is now why we have this chain of blocks of transactions. And this is why we call this technology blockchain. So if you ever thought it was very confusing and uh, uh, complicated, this is what we have today. Okay, um, uh, now you can put it on your, on your LinkedIn profile, right? So now you understand what a blockchain is. So now, uh, the, the interesting thing as well is that we don't just have one. There are very many different types of blockchains that exist today, and you're going to start hearing about, if you've only heard about Bitcoin today, this, this currency that's recorded on this blockchain, you're going to see that there's all sorts of currencies that are coming out now. This idea has now been planted in the world, and uh, people are starting to take that idea and starting to create their own versions of Bitcoin. And there's hundreds, literally hundreds of them, and the most uh, famous ones, I guess, are uh, Ethereum, if you've ever heard of Ethereum. That's a, a, a blockchain with its own uh, uh, features and its own ways of doing things, uh, and a whole bunch of others, Litecoin and uh, um, uh, Dash. So what you're going to be doing is, now that you are getting into the space, is you're going to have to now try and figure out, well, what's going on here? You know, which is the one that uh, a lot of people say, well, if Bitcoin uh, uh, has all these competitors, why is Bitcoin so special? Um, uh, and this is going to be the question that we now have to ask ourselves over time. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you why I believe Bitcoin is going to be the one that rules them all. Um, it's the same as the internet. You know, uh, did you know back in the early days of the internet, there were all these competing versions of the internet, like AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy, and ultimately this, this open source TCP IP protocol eventually became widespread and everybody started using it. And because of that network effect, it became the most use, used one. And now today we have one internet. Of course, there are intranets and companies, but the most useful thing right now is one internet because now if I email you, I don't have to ask you what internet you're on. Now, Bitcoin is kind of like that. There are competing protocols, but Bitcoin is the one that's most widely used. It's the most secure. It's the, most one, the one that's most developed. And I think over the long term, the world will have one internet and will have one Bitcoin type currency. Yes, of course, there will be these little side chains of currencies. But uh, if you were thinking about investing in uh, a currency like this, uh, I I'm going to give you a suggestion that uh, to me, Bitcoin is the only one that I actually uh, trust for the long term. Now, again, if you're not sure that uh, uh, this is uh, 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 an important thing, this is just uh, uh, some uh, relative uh, chart to show you the investment. You know, in the early days of the internet, there's a lot of investment going into those companies. Relatively speaking, adjusted for inflation, uh, uh, there's more more investment going into this technology than there is for the internet. So um, again, you know, this is all about showing you that uh, uh, this is coming and this is here to stay. This is not a fad. This is not something that, uh, you know, only techies and geeks are, are interested in. You are one day going to have, uh, and, and uh, my other business has sent me, uh, you are going to have hopefully one day my wallet in your, in your, on your phone and you're going to be able to transact and buy Bitcoin and buy things at, the, at Woolworths or whatever you do with Bitcoin. Um, this is just to, to show you some more uh, interesting stats. You know, the transactions are going up in the world um, and uh, uh, there's uh, addresses, which are basically accounts that are being created. Uh, the hash rate just shows you the, the security and the, the, uh, the, the how transactions are being processed. But there's a whole lot of these types of statistics. Wallets are basically apps. You know, if you download an app like Snapscan, you know, you can get Bitcoin uh, Snapscans. Um, okay, so now you must be convinced, right, that uh, uh, this is a big thing. This is a big deal. And uh, if you're not thinking about this and you're not taking it seriously, you're going to be left behind. Just like if you didn't want to have an email address, you, you are a holdout. No, I refuse to get an email address, you know. I refuse to get a mobile phone. I'm not going to be one of those people, you know. Um, that, that's kind of how it is today. All right. Now, a lot of people say, okay, cool, Lauren, I get that Bitcoin is an interesting technology and it's money. Okay, fine. I get that there's a value for it. Um, it has a finite supply. It kind of acts like a digital version of gold. And so it acts like a commodity in that way. And people are starting to trade it, you know, buy and sell Bitcoins. And it's all about supply and demand. If a lot of people want Bitcoins, uh, the supply stays the same, the price goes up and the price goes down. Now, over the last few years, uh, this has kind of been the chart. Obviously, the chart now has reached that all-time high and gone way higher than that. But I wanted to just show you, uh, this is about uh, a year ago, 
what the price looked like. If I was to show this to you and say, this is a worthwhile investing, it's a good form of money, you'd say, sorry, this is a terrible form of money because one of the important things about money is that it must be a store of value. In other words, if you have 100 bucks in your pocket now and you want to go and uh, buy something that's worth 100 Rand tomorrow, you want to make sure your 100 Rand is worth, still worth 100 Rand. But when it comes to Bitcoin, Bitcoin has been, uh, and this is the, the thing that we all hear about, it's been incredibly volatile. You know, it's up 30% one day, down 30% the next day, and that's just crazy when it comes to you know an investment if you want to you know if you're investing in something but um, uh, the, the amazing thing is is that this picture this shape seems to come up a lot when it comes to technology I'm going to overlay another chart for you and this is the Nasdaq composite can you see a, a pattern there this is this picture where things go crazy and then they go down again and crash has actually been modeled by a lot of sort of uh, tech analyst kind of companies. And they, sh they have realized that all technology goes through this, this kind of bubble. And it's called the hype cycle. Gartner uh, has this thing called the hype cycle. And um, this is what it looks like. And uh, it says whenever there's a new technology that comes along, people start hearing about it, and then they start getting into it, and then suddenly more people get into it, and it starts going crazy, and everyone gets excited, and then you know everyone there's a rush to get in, but then suddenly reality sets in, and this is what happened with the internet, you know, because most people didn't have modems, and nobody wants to put their credit cards online, and uh, uh, we reach this thing called the peak of inflated expectations, and then what happens is we plunge into the trough of disillusionment, which is that bottom over there, where we realize, okay, it's not that great, and maybe we're not ready yet. Um, but ultimately, we climb up the slope of enlightenment, and uh, this is what happened with the internet. Um, and it looks like Bitcoin is exactly doing that. And in fact, Gartner has put the blockchain technology that makes Bitcoin possible onto a hype cycle, because they publish a, a list of technologies every year that they say is now following the hype cycle trend. And right now, they've got all sorts of things like AI, and machine learning, and big data, and drones, and whatever. They've put blockchain on there. So maybe we are now looking at uh, something that uh, you know, is following all the trends. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly growing. It's certainly interesting. It certainly solves problems in terms of hyperinflation and other things. Um, but uh, uh, it looks like it's following the tech trends as well. Okay, so now what I want to do is tell you more about uh, all the problems we're facing in our lives. I want to tell you how bad the world is, you know, and uh, why, why the, uh, things are so awful and why you should be aware of these things at least so you can start making decisions about, you know, how to protect yourself perhaps. You know, it's not that Bitcoin is this cool technology that people are looking at and saying, wow, this really, this is really cool. It's really slick. It's really fancy, you know. Um, there's a lot of economic issues and I showed you about hyperinflation around the world today but there's actually so many other issues that are going on and you might be aware of some of them and I want to show you more problems in the world I want to make you more depressed of, uh, about the world but with the idea that there is a solution and this is what I think and many people like me now are beginning to think is a solution this Bitcoin idea is a solution now there's a whole lot of economic things that are going that are driving people out of the system Getting, if people want to get out of the system and into a new system, whatever it is. Now, there's this idea of negative interest rates. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Imagine if you were to borrow money and you got paid for borrowing money you know, on your house. Let's say you earn 17%. Uh, uh, that sounds pretty cool, actually, for people who borrow money. But what if you're saving money? You know, if you save money in Europe or Japan or whatever, you're going to lose money on those savings. You're not going to earn interest. You're going to pay interest to do that. This has been happening now since 2008, since the global economy is so terrible to stimulate growth and make sure people spend so GDP starts pumping. Negative interest rates are there to, to uh, 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 make sure that you don't want to save, that you want to spend, you know, so, so the economy is driven. And this is a trend that is happening around the world. Another thing is bank bail-ins. You know, the, uh, that, the, what happened in, the, uh, in 2008, there is now legislation in the world where banks have a rule, and if you look at the fine print, that says if the bank starts to struggle, if they have problems with liquidity or whatever it is, they're going to now take money out of your bank account, and it's theirs. That's how it is. Remember, you're a shareholder in the bank. Well, not a shareholder, but you're loaning money to the bank. Um, uh, and this is now legislated, legislated in, the, in, the, in the many banks around the world. Um, hyperinflation, we've already uh, spoken about. War on cash. Remember what happened in India, where uh, Modi took all these uh, high denominator value notes out of the economy. Um, that's not the only uh, country. You know, Canada, Australia, uh, America, they're all talking about getting rid of cash. Because no banks, no central banks like cash. Because if you now pay somebody with cash, that's not recorded anywhere. There's no tax, there's no fees, there's no uh, uh, um, uh, visibility on that transaction. So the, the ultimate end game for the banks around the world is to completely get rid of all the paper currencies that are in your pocket today. 
All right. And uh, this is now a, a, a trend that is moving. And uh, we saw what happened in India. Also, a lot of people want to get money out of the country. We see that within, uh, with China. There's a lot of people who are unbanked. You know, 80% of Africans are unbanked. A lot of geopolitical uncertainty and risk. You know, Syria, it seems like World War III is on our doorstep. And it's creating a lot of uh, attention for a lot of people. And then just basically trust. People have lost trust. But also, do you know, when it comes to moving money uh, around the world, uh, uh, do you know that Africa, poorest, one of the poorest uh, continents, uh, look, this is how much it costs. If you wanted to now move money uh, from uh, uh, South Africa to Botswana or Mozambique, these are the costs that you're going to be paying. You have to pay an enormous amount of money if you want to send uh, money to the next country. Yes, of course, there are some fintechs that are now managing to bring that down, but the poorest people in the world, Zimbabweans sending money from here to Zimbabwe are having to pay these sorts of rates. So can you see how the financial system itself just doesn't have uh, 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 it seems like there's a lot wanting there. Okay, so I've painted this very terrible picture for you. But uh, uh, again, you know, it's important that you start thinking about these things because this is going to be something that doesn't just carry on quietly without you noticing. This is going to one day be in your face. And uh, you had be have better kind of have some awareness around it. Um, okay, so uh, uh, let me quickly now tell you about the internet. Uh, I'll get away from the school uh, side of things. You know, the, the, the internet has, be you know, in the early days of the internet, it was all about, um, uh, uh, you know, everyone now can be on online, everyone can now access the internet, everyone can have a voice, everyone can uh, c uh, trade and, and do that sort of thing. But what happened was that the internet became very siloed. You now know, I mean, if you want to search, you use two or three search engines. If you want to go on a social network platform, you use Facebook or whatever it is, or Twitter. Um, uh, even Uber, you know, Uber is kind of starting to monopolize this ride sharing thing. I know that there's Lyft and other companies like that, but it's, it looks like the promise of the internet was all about, you know, uh, de de decentralizing it a bit more and giving everybody an opportunity. But all that's happened is that there's been this, this siloing effect where now all of us basically use a couple services, you know, and, and, and all that information is being held by those companies. And there's that, that point of failure. Now, um, this Bitcoin thing, another amazing thing about it, and now I'm going to give you a glimpse into the future. And this is a, a, what a lot of people who are thinking about these things realize the world, where the world is going. See these companies that look so amazing? They are going to disappear. I know that sounds incredible. When I say to you, Google is going to disappear, or Facebook is going to disappear, or Uber is going to disappear. Because now, Bitcoin has given us the ability to have digital payments, and not only digital payments in terms of moving cash, but peer-to-peer -peer payments. In other words, if I pay you money, I don't have to go through a bank. That simple little concept is going to mean the end of businesses that basically act as glorified payment hubs. Now, have you all used Uber? Do you know that all Uber does, really, their, their role is to act as a glorified payment hub, where they are facilitating payments from the driver to the passenger. But if you could pay your driver directly, why do you need an Uber? Now, a lot of people will say, no, but hang on, Uber's not just a payment system. Uber is a nifty little app, and I can see my car the driver coming to me. Uber isn't big and enormous because they have this little fancy app. Those apps are, uh, people can create apps, anyone can create an app like that. But what is difficult is being a, becoming a, a regulated financial services facilitator. And that's why we have companies like Uber that are able to do that. But if you were to, again, uh, this is just a picture of, of, the, of the Uber uh, system, you know, where we have these passengers and we have these drivers and we all have to now go through Uber to do that. If we now can do this, Uber becomes irrelevant, and its whole uh, point of existence becomes irrelevant. And uh, I'm not just saying that this is the future. This is today. There are companies now, because of uh, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies like it, that they are coming up, uh, uh, that are now be creating these decentralized services. There's a company called Arcade City in uh, Austin, Texas, and they are a decentralized Uber. You basically download an open source app, and you now pay your drivers directly. Um, there are companies that are doing these decentralized storages and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, uh, you're going to see again that the future, the theme of the future, is going to be decentralization, where these major organizations disappear because now we have the ability to make microtransactions peer-to-peer. Uh, Okay, so this is the theme of the future. If you ever want to know about marketing and, and uh, how to pitch you know, your ideas in the future, start thinking in this way, because this is the trend that we're headed into. Not just the disintermediation of banks and payments and finance, but the disintermediation of these big monolithic centralized services like Google Drive or, or Dropbox. I want to quickly just go through some of the use cases around blockchain, and then I'm going to tell you a personal story uh, uh, about how uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin is actually making real uh, lives uh, different. It's, it's something that I've uh, been involved with. 
Okay, so let me quickly take you through some of the other ideas around what blockchain can do other than payments. I mean, I've spoken about payments. Okay, like I said, this is a this is a, an intensive like bundle of information. Uh, this there is a recording of this going out, so you must come back and and try and uh, if if you missed it, if you can tolerate it, if you can stomach it, uh, we'll try and listen to it again because something in here, you know, uh, I, I believe is going to uh, maybe trigger a, a, a direction for you, you know, a direction change. Okay, okay, so blockchain. Why, is people, why are people hyping on blockchain so much and not so much Bitcoin? As I said to you before, Bitcoin is very politically incorrect. I mean, if I, can go, if I go and say, listen, guys, we don't need banks anymore. We don't need government anymore, central banks anymore. Of course, that's going to create tension in the status quo. You know, uh, nobody, oh, I engage the central bank. In fact, I've given these talks to the central bank uh, uh, here already. And, uh, you know, they, they seem open to this idea that this could be happening. Um, but uh, uh, blockchain itself is very neutral. Okay, fine, it's tech. All right, let's, let's see what else we can do with it. Um, although I believe that uh, uh, Bitcoin is more important than blockchain, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that. Okay, payments and money, definitely. Blockchain is going to change the world in that regard. Um, we see how stock exchanges are thinking about this, you know, where you can now issue a share on a blockchain, and that means if I want to buy a share from you, I don't have to go through the stock exchange, through the central securities depositories, through the banks. I don't have to do any of that. I could just email you my share in a way. It's not email, but you know, I could send you that share. So that's going to really uh, uh, toss up that uh, industry as well. Um, this notion of something called a smart contract, which uh, all I can say is that uh, what these things are going to do is pro hopefully disintermediate lawyers, perhaps. You know, Are there any lawyers here, by the way? Just before I make a lawyer joke. Anyway, maybe that's a good thing. Um, this, you know, have you heard about the Internet of Things? You know, people say that the missing thing in the Internet of Things is for those devices to not just communicate with each other, but to transact with each other. You know, so uh, the example that always comes up is if you have a fridge and you, and you run out of milk and your fridge needs to buy milk, you're not going to give your fridge your credit card. Sounds a bit dodgy. Maybe you can give your fridge some little uh, bitcoins, you know, a few amount, enough to buy, buy milk and your, bit, and your fridge can go and buy stuff. But uh, obviously it gets more complicated than that. We see big companies now trying to do identity, like passports and social security and IDs and all that sort of thing. Vinny Lingam is a South African entrepreneur in San Francisco now, and he's got a company called Civic, and he's trying to do this blockchain identity. Um, another in interesting thing is what's called provenance, you know, supply chain stuff. You know, if you uh, go to the grocery store and you buy something on the shelf, you don't know where that thing came from. Uh, it would be nice to be able to scan the barcode, and then you can see the whole route of where that stuff came from. You know, oh, it went, came from that town, from that farm. Great, I have confidence now that it's ethically sourced or whatever. Uh, companies are doing that with diamonds, you know, so you can know if your diamond was stolen or if it came from a, an unethical source or something like that. People saying that maybe we can put health records or secure them on a blockchain. Um, title deeds, imagine if you had your title deed as a token uh, of ownership and then you wanted to sell your house, all you do is you just send the token to somebody else and now they own the house. Can you imagine what that's going to do to regular uh, uh, conveyancing and all that sort of thing? Um, people are thinking about it like that. Uh, government, you know, with voting. Imagine if you could now see up to the second exactly how many votes are being uh, recorded for your candidate or for the op opposition. You know, right now, yes, we've got uh, observers and all that sort of thing who audit those uh, votes. But imagine if you could see in real time as your candidates are being voted for what they, what's going on there. And it couldn't be uh, 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 corrupted or anything like that. Uh, massive uh, implications there. Um, uh, security for information, uh, uh, tr uh, trade finance. You know, you don't need banks now to give letters of credit. You know, now you can just send uh, credit smart contracts which automatically send money. And then uh, lastly, what I was telling you about before, actually second lastly, but the top one is boring, it's auditing. Um, uh, this, that funny crazy little icon, I wanted it to be actually be crazy, that's a good idea, because as I said to you before, imagine a decentralized world where you don't have Uber, you don't have Dropbox. What you're doing is you're storing little bits of your files on millions of people's computers all around the world. Impossible before, but now tiny little microtransactions paying everybody whose machine you're borrowing resources from. That's going to be how things are. You're not going to have Google Drive or Dropbox. So uh, can you see how this is just a lightning uh, a tour of all the crazy things that people are talking about blockchain? Um, and uh, again, Gartner has put uh, blockchain on this list. This is, this is where they've put it. Um, so you can see now that maybe the hype is, is going to be uh, uh, imploding soon. And if you are a blockchain uh, person, um, you know, trying to sell the hype, you know, it looks like bad times are coming. I believe it. Um, you know, my company, uh, Banky Moon, uh, I've been uh, founded it three years ago almost. And I've been focused 100% on trying to figure out 
if blockchain can do what everyone says it can do. I'm actually a software engineer, um, and uh, for 20 years I've been building systems for banks and uh, energy companies and media and advertising and all that sort of thing. And uh, I think all this, that whole wheel of amazing things that are likely, um, probably unlikely. I actually put blockchain around about there. I think you know in the next couple of months people are going to start thinking, whoa, you know, maybe this blockchain thing isn't so great. But as to as I said to you before, Bitcoin itself as a decentralized currency, a digital form of gold, you know, if you are uh, if you are willing to take a risk, not that I'd give you investment advice, um, but I think that it's going to turn out to be one of the most uh, you know important dis financial decisions of your life. You know, you know put a, put a couple hundred bucks in, see you know see what happens. You know, if you'd done that a year ago, you'd be quite happy right now. Um, I think that we haven't even started seeing uh, the value of Bitcoin right now. Right now, Bitcoin is about 40,000 Rand of one. Um, you may, uh, just to tell you, you don't have to buy one. You can buy five Rand's worth or 100 Rand's worth of Bitcoin. Okay, I think uh, that's the uh, idea that maybe this is a new technology that looks weird and confusing and, and uh, 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 you know, why do we need it and how does it work and what's going on? You know, it fits actually so well with the way things are. And by the way, this is going to keep on happening. You know, in 10 years' time, there's going to be some other technology that comes along that your kids are playing around with and you're not going to understand, and then it's going to change everything again. Okay, have you noticed the trend? All these things happen. I mean, it's not like the end of invention. You know, uh, in 10 years' time, there's going to be something new, and then in 10 years later, there's going to be something else. This is just how life is. You know, human beings, we're innovative, we're creative. I want to now give you a story about, again, why Bitcoin, this peer-to-peer -peer payment system, is so cool and so important and so necessary. And it's all about this guy. Have you ever watched this movie? Um, uh, about Schmidt. It's about this guy who uh, is forced into retirement. He's old and irrelevant, and his boss basically retires him. And then soon after, his wife dies, and he runs out of, you know, uh, he has no meaning in life. He, you know, he finds himself without purpose. And uh, so he, fi he stumbles onto this little flyer, uh, this little uh, uh, aid organization with this boy's face on it. And uh, he looks at this and he says, oh, wow, you know, this, this little boy, I, I want to actually contribute to this boy's life. I want to support this guy. I want to actually, you know, I need meaning in my life and I want to, uh, you know, help somebody. So what he does is he starts uh, uh, writing these letters and paying money every month to this boy. But in his mind, he thinks that he's directly communicating with this little guy, um, the, the face on this on his flyer you know he thinks uh, this money is going to that little boy and that little boy is able to buy things you know uh, whatever it is toys or, or whatever it is to ma make his life better um, but this is actually not the reality when it comes to uh, uh, donor funding you know if you are, were to go and donate to an organization you know we would like to think that all that money that we donate is going directly to the cause that we believe in but just in the same way that remittance companies and banks are middlemen, and what they do is they take their cut. Uh, uh, aid organizations, in spite of, I mean, of course they are doing good, and, uh, and, and we must appreciate them, but there's st are still a lot of kind of uh, inefficiencies in the, mo in the model, and also sometimes corruption and all sorts of things that go on, fees and admin costs and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, that money that you donate might not necessarily go to that little boy that on, the, on that uh, cover. It might go through to other things. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, directly fund the causes that we believe in without having to go through this intermediary that opaquely distributes the funds and takes cuts and you know, cuts a uh, value out of that chain? Wouldn't that be cool? So uh, this is now a project I uh, initiated a few years ago. And in fact, uh, I have a very old friend here, Kate. Uh, and she, and it, what's uh, cool about this is that she was the first person I told about this uh, project. Um, so I'm glad that she's here. Where's Kate? Are you here, Kate? Yes, Kate, hello. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to tell you the story of what, uh, what something I initiated. And, and I just came back from Switzerland and gave a TEDx talk on this. So you can see that there's something about this that just appeals to people. And uh, to, to not uh, give you too much detail about this, the idea was that imagine if you could link a Bitcoin payment to a smart meter. There's a lot of m smart meters around the world today, uh, you know, pre prepaid meters and all that sort of thing. So I had this idea to now link a Bitcoin payment to a meter. And uh, that means that you can now send a Bitcoin Bitcoin directly to the meter and it would create, a, 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 it would actually uh, buy energy for that meter and fund it. Uh, this was kind of the industry I was involved with and this was my idea. Uh, but then I had these other ideas about this. You know, I thought, well, what are the use cases for that? You know, because if you are anywhere in the world, you can now, you don't have to be near the meter, you can now send money directly to that meter and fund it because it's a Bitcoin transaction. Bitcoin is, is when you send money from one country to another, you're not doing a cross-border payment. 
you know um, there's no such thing as sending money from me to you Bitcoin is is everywhere at the same time so there's no such thing so it's very easy to make payments across the borders so imagine if you're a student studying abroad and uh, you know you run out of electricity and you phone your mom and say mom please send me money I've got to pay electricity she goes and sends it through Western Union it costs 10% um, it takes three days or whatever it is and eventually that student gets the money well now the student can um, you know just the m mom can now directly fund that meter it takes a few uh, seconds to do that but another uh, 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 idea is imagine there's a needy African school and there are foreign donors around the world well they can now directly fund the energy costs of that school without going through an organization that uh, distributes the funds in other ways or takes costs or uh, uh, you know d does something else with that money um, you can actually now directly fund the cause you believe in because you're making a peer-to-peer -peer payment you're making a payment from yourself to that cause that you believe in. And uh, so I decided to not just talk about that because that was the use case I gave. I actually decided to go and do it. Um, I, uh, there was a school in Soweto, it's called Emoweni Primary School. And now most schools in, in South Africa, this is the problem, they get a little budget. And uh, what happens is they're gonna now use that budget to now function. You know, they've got to pay for stuff. They've got to buy books. They've got to fix windows. They've got to fix the toilets. They've got to mow the lawn. They've got to do all those sorts of things. And most of the time, those schools run out of uh, the money. And, and MOA isn't even, you know, one of the, the, the neediest schools out there. There are many schools out there that have nothing. And uh, uh, the schools basically are, are, are just you know, not functioning well. Um, so this little school over here, uh, MOA Primary School, what I did was I, I went there and we and, and I went and installed this uh, uh, this uh, uh, Bitcoin meter at the school. And now that I had this over there, I was like, okay, well now what do we do? You know, I want to tell people, I want to, you know, maybe we can get some donors to now directly fund the energy of the school. Um, I had a friend who uh, was giving a conference at MIT. He's based in Vienna, uh, and he heard about this and he said, hey, Lauren, why don't I, during my conference, send a Bitcoin? to the meter, and then everyone can see how instantaneously, you know, the school uh, can, can light up. So it was three o'clock in the morning for me, uh, he was in MIT in Boston, and uh, so I drove down to the school, it was co uh, completely dark, and then Ed, uh, he's the guy there, uh, I Skyped in, and I, and I started telling everybody about it. I said, yes, this is Emoweni, and then here it is, it's in Soweto in South Africa, across the world from you, um, and uh, uh, this, this little school, uh, 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 you can see it's completely because there was no energy on the meat at the time. Um, and I said, uh, uh, this is how it works. If you send a Bitcoin now to this address, you know, an address is like an account number, uh, which is on the meter, you'll be able to now directly pay for the energy of that school. And so what Ed did was he uh, sent one Bitcoin to the address. Now, one Bitcoin in those days was about 7,000 Rand, so about 5,500 kilowatts of energy. Um, and uh, it, uh, what happened was he, he clicked send, and it, and it took a few seconds, and it eventually hit the meter. I was sitting in a classroom at the time, and uh, the delegates of the conference didn't know that the teachers and the parents, who were so excited, they want to see what was going on, had actually arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning in their pajamas and all that sort of thing, were sitting behind me. I was on Skype there, and as soon as the lights went on, because now the, suddenly there was electricity loaded, uh, there was this mad uh, eruption. <laughs> uh, everyone was like, whoa, this is crazy, this is so excited. And, you know, the, the, the delegates of the conference actually felt hang on, they've actually now directly touched the lives of somebody across the world using this technology, which is completely poss impossible using Western Union remittances, using a bank, using an aid organization. You could never do that uh, uh, with, with the technology we have today, but now you can. So if that is just one use case that makes this technology interesting, you know, uh, uh, and that's all it ever does, well, that's good enough. You know, the ability now to give donors that, that kind of confidence that their money is being spent in the right sort of way Way. Um, but also what's cool is that we can now reach what's called the long tail of charitable uh, donations. Long tail, you know, the, uh, if you ever read Chris Anderson's book on the long tail, he talks about products, you know, um, how there's a few products that has, have a huge market share and then there's a lot of little products that have very little market share. And that's that long, long tail. But apply it to the, uh, core, the, the donor model, you know, there's a lot of organizations, not a lot, there's a few organizations that take most of the money, and then there's all these other little causes that get little or no money. But with this ability now to be able to send money directly with low cost directly to that cause and without intermediaries, you can now reach that long tail. No matter that little cause, no matter how small, you can now go and reach it 
you know, 20 rand. Can you imagine sending 20 rand now to some or cause? 20 rand, you know, it, it, it's tiny uh, uh, an amount of money, but that might make a difference in somebody's life, and we can now do that with Bitcoin. Okay, so that's it. Uh, if, by the way, if you would like to uh, uh, be involved in this project, I'm actually trying to uh, uh, you know, kind of create a, a, a whole thing about this, you know, create a Kickstarter-type platform, a website. In fact, if you go to secret.usizo.org, uh, you'll kind of see the website. It's kind of like Kickstarter. You go to the school, and you can see... Uh, who the school, what the school is, and the kids, and the teachers, and blah blah blah. Uh, you can now go and donate directly to that school. So I'm trying to now get this this project going. Um, hopefully, we can roll out a, a prop pilot with ten schools. Uh, now I've gone uh, to many conferences in in Europe and America, and it's amazing how Europeans and Americans like it's almost like this guilt. You know, they 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 all want to do this. They all want to be. You know, uh, they all want to contribute to the world in some way. I know it sounds crazy, but they do. And when they hear uh, they hear, hear about this story, they're all like that's great you know please tell us when it's working when it's signed up because we then we, we want we want to do in our own small way make a difference so i'm sure that this project could you know you know, make some kind of impact and certainly make an impact on the little schools that we and we could do hospitals as well but if you'd like to know more about it uh, uh, go to my website or uh, contact me or whatever it is follow me or go to my youtube channel um, and i'll be happy to engage you and tell you more about it thank you <laughs>